magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent, and in this video, I will be running you through a very particular Farseer build that will transform one of your Space Elf Mystics into one of the most powerful engines for dealing mortal wounds in all of 40k. It involves the Relic Kernis's Bow and the Warlord trait Mark of the Incomparable Hunter, as well as shenanigans with Strands of Fate dice and a particular far-flung craft world attribute, and perhaps also a stratagem. So there are a lot of moving parts here, but it's incredibly potent. It's seen play at top tables on the tournament circuit, including a list that recently won the Dallas Open uh, undefeated. So it's it's fabulous. It's, uh, it's not immediately obvious that this potential exists. I missed it in my first read-through of the Codex. And also it involves perhaps reviewing our understanding of Strands of Fate. There are a lot of misconceptions out there about how Strands of Fate works because of some uh, convoluted phrasing in the Codex. We're going to take a look at that and demystify it. But first, a quick shout out to my patrons. Thank you so much for your support. I so appreciate it. Uh, I, I could not do it without you. Those of you who might be interested in becoming patrons, I will put a link in the video description. My patrons enjoy early access to these videos. So there's the plug. Okay, let's talk about the Mortal Wound Mayhem Farseer uh, from the ground up. Step one, add a Farseer Skyrunner to your list. You, you could, of course, give this loadout to a Farseer on foot, but uh, that's not a great idea. So you start with Farseer Skyrunner. You give the Farseer Skyrunner the Relic Kernis Bow and the Warlord trait Mark of the Incomparable Hunter. And before we talk about how why this is best in a custom craft world list, a far flung craft world list, we're going to take a look at those two assets in order to understand how they work in concert with one another. First, Kernos's bow, and I'm on page 114 of the Codex. If you'd like to follow along at home, I'll also throw up the stats on the screen. So, Kernos's bow is a relic pistol. It's a shuriken pistol, so it replaces a typical shuriken pistol. It has a range of 18 inches. It's pistol 3, strength 5, and then it has no AP because it doesn't need AP because the way it works is it has the shuriken keyword, and each time an attack is made with this weapon, if that attack successfully wounds the target, it inflicts one mortal wound on the target, and the attack sequence ends. Initially, this just doesn't look that earth-shattering. So, yes, your Farseer has a ballistic skill of 2, so would hit on twos and then strength five is pretty good and if you wound you get to just ignore the armor save so it's also a way to get around invulnerable saves and you do a mortal wound and maybe you do as many as three mortal wounds but that would involve hitting and wounding three times so probably not um whoop de doo right not not initially that impressive but in concert with mark of the incomparable hunter things start to get interesting i'm now on page 119 of the Codex. Mark of the Incomparable Hunter is a Warlord trait that adds one to the strength characteristic of the Warlord's ranged attacks and an unmodified wound roll of six now inflicts one mortal wound on the target in addition to any normal damage. So now uh, your Kernos's bow on sixes to wound is doing an additional mortal wound. Still not all of that, still not all that impressive. Sure, you could use Strands of Fate dice on your wound roll in order to guarantee sixes to wound and therefore pick up some additional mortals, but how many Strands of Fate dice do you really have? Now, some of you at home might be freaking out, but Brent, you can only guarantee one additional mortal wound because you think you can only use one Strands of Fate die uh, in each phase of the game, or some of you may be under the impression that you can only use one on each unit in each phase. And that is not the case. 
uh, I flip to 143 in your codex, we are going to review Strands of Fate. And for those of you who are already aware of this, just bear with me. I'll, I will I will try to be quick here, but this is really very important for people who have not been playing this correctly. And I've seen stories online about even TOs, tournament organizers, at least at the RTT level, just fundamentally not understanding how Strands works because of some convoluted phrasing. So the way Strands of Fate works is in a 2000 point game, you roll six dice at the beginning of the battle round. And then for each Farseer in your list, you can re-roll one of those dice. The build that I am talking about with this Farseer works best when you have three for reasons that I will get to. Two is, two is fine. Three is best. Uh, and then you get to keep four of those dice at 2,000 points to manipulate dice rolls. Each one counts as a six for an advanced roll. Each two for a charge roll. Three is psychic tests, four hit roll, five wound roll, six saving throw. All of you are with me so far, nothing new. Now, this next piece of text, though, has confused people tremendously. Before making a roll of any of these types that I just named for a unit with the Strands of Fate ability, if any of your retained dice have a result corresponding with that type of roll, as shown above, and have not been used to manipulate a roll this battle round, you can manipulate that role. Now, what this means is you can't use the same die twice. It does not mean that you can only manipulate one type of role, like one charge role in each battle round. That is not what it means. Look at it again. If any individual die has a result corresponding with that type of role and have not been used to manipulate a battle die. So, and have not been used is still modifying individual die. What's confusing here is that this is actually a grammatical error. Uh, in English, any is secondary, or is, excuse me, English is singular, and any is singular in English. And so have really ought to be has, but it is absolutely clear here that it refers to the individual die. Uh, if that type of role involves a D6 role, then you can manipulate the role. And if there's any question about this, look down at the example. In the example, uh, we are told that a person who retains two twos can manipulate two charge rolls in the same battle round. So there's really no ambiguity around this at all. And there is nothing to prevent a particular unit from manipulating multiple rolls. Uh, a psyker can do this in multiple psychic tests. Uh, and a unit that's shooting can do this with multiple shooting attacks. So if you have pistol three, you can manipulate multiple dice. And by the way, just to be absolutely positive, I have checked this with play testers and I have checked it with people who over at Goonhammer who organized some of the biggest tournaments in all of 40K. And this, this really is correct. The, the reason that people get confused is that you can only manipulate one die per roll. And so if you if you shoot three times with a pistol, that's three different rolls. But the reason it's confusing is if you are casting powers and you're doing psychic tests and you're rolling two dice for an individual psychic test, you can only manipulate one of those dice. So you, what you cannot do, the place where you cannot use two dice on the same unit is you cannot guarantee that you get a 12 on a psychic test. You set one die to a six and you roll the second die. But the only time, the only time that you can't influence multiple dice is when a roll requires you to roll two dice for the same roll. But even though we roll a lot of dice at once, often for our hit rolls for expediency sake, those are all individual rolls. They can be slow rolled. In fact, sometimes they have to be. Again, there's nothing in the rules to prevent you from doing what I am about to suggest. And I think you probably already see this coming. So let's go back to Mark of the Incomparable Hunter. Kurnos's bow has gone from strength five to strength six because Mark of the Incomparable Hunter gives you plus one to the strength in your shooting attacks. And on a six to wound, Mark of the Incomparable Hunter will do an additional mortal wound on top of the one already done by Kurnos's bow. So on sixes to wound, you're doing two mortals. This means that you can use strands of fate die uh, if you have wound rolls, right, to guarantee two mortal wounds. But the strands of fate are fickle. Even if you have three Farseers, you're rolling six die and re-rolling three of them trying to get wound rolls. Even if you're doing that, only one in six, so 1.5 on average will give you the sixes you need. Enter far-flung craft world traits. 
This Farseer works best in a far-flung craft world, custom craft world list that makes use of Hail of Doom. I am now on page 90 of the Codex. Hail of Doom is a craft world trait that works like this. Each time a model with this attribute makes an attack roll with a shuriken weapon, which the relic pistol is, an unmodified hit roll of six automatically wounds the target and is treated as an unmodified wound roll of six. This means that not only do your sixes to hit, uh, do just auto do two wounds to the target, because if you get a six to hit, it counts also as a six to wound because of Hail of Doom, which triggers Mark of the Incomparable Hunter, which adds a mortal wound. So that means that going back to Strands of Fate, you can now also use sixes for two hit rolls to guarantee two mortal wounds. So if you roll nine Strands of Fate dice for... Uh, you have a one in three chance because on each of those die on either the hit roll or the wound roll. And the hit roll is better because the Farseer only misses on a one, but nevertheless, you'd like to guarantee it. Uh, you are going to be able to guarantee two mortal wounds. So if you're rolling nine dice, because you can reroll three, so you're just definitely going to, if you know your Farseer is going to use this and you need to max the mortal wounds, you do this by step one, rolling six dice and retaining any fours and fives, because fours modify the hit roll, fives modify the wound roll. And then all the dice that didn't roll fours and fives, you pick those up and you roll again to try to get more fours and fives. So you're you're rolling uh, up to nine dice. On average, you're going to get three. And so if you're converting all of those over, that's guaranteeing you uh, six wounds six mortal wounds because any six to hit will be counted because of the far flung craft world trait also is a six to wound which gives you an extra wound for mark of the incomparable hunter and six is to wound on those strands of fate wound die give you one for mark of the incomparable hunter so it's pistol three on average you're going to do mortals with all of those it gets even more crazy if you look and you see that you have at least two dice that are sixes for the hit roll, at least two, three would be amazing. Then it makes sense to also spend a CP for the stratagem Blade Storm. This is a one point CP strat. I'm on page 98 of the codex. Uh, until the end of the phase, each time a model in the unit makes an attack with a shuriken weapon, an unmodified hit roll of six scores one additional hit. So if you look down and you see, I can get two hit rolls of six you know that each of those is going to do two mortal wounds. And if you pop the strat, it will also generate an additional hit. Now, what it does not do is count that additional hit as also a six, even though technically you rolled a six that generated now two hits because of the stratagem and your custom craft world trait says that your six is to hit, count as six is to wound. It, there's, a, there's a rare rule in the core rule book that prevents uh, rule effects from stacking in this way. So those additional hits generated by, by Blade Storm, they don't automatically count as sixes to wound. You could then spend Strands of Fate die on them when you get to the wound roll phase and turn them into sixes, but you would have to roll them normally. But what this means is that on average, you're going to do six mortal wounds without Blade Storm. And then if you, if you use Blade Storm, you will have access to additional dice that are, you know, wounding at strength six and doing additional mortals. If you roll a six, two additional mortals. And in some sort of crazy world in which, you know, you end up with like three auto sixes to hit from Strands of Fate and one wound die, you could guarantee that this goes to eight mortal. It's just a crazy, crazy combination. And what makes this intensely awesome is that it's, it's resource intensive with reference to strands of fate, but not really resource intensive with reference to what you have to allocate to it to make it work in a list. If you are running a far-flung craft world, Hail of Doom is, if it is not the best far-flung craft world trait, it is first equal with anything else. It is so good. Uh, again, it Nick Nanavati took it in the list that he won the Dallas Open with, and, and a lot of the really high-performing lists in the big opens and GTs, uh, we're seeing this, right? There's in, in America, people are running a lot of Ulthway and there's been more for, far flung in the UK and now we're getting more far flung in the States. But but across the board, this is a this is a very powerful, very popular one with a proven track record. So it's not like you have to handicap yourself 
in order to make this build work. It it's already one of the best far flung craft world builds, and it's not like you're taking oh I didn't I wouldn't have taken a far seer, but now I need to allocate the points for that. It's a model that you are going to take anyway, and it doesn't prevent your far seer from doing any of the things that a far seer usually does, right? Because you're still gonna you're still gonna cast your psychic powers, so. What it, what it costs you is a warlord trait and a relic. And if you didn't have room in your list, if you, if you already have a warlord trait that you really, really need, you can spend a CP for a second one. Uh, and frankly, by the way, if you don't have one that you really, really need, you should spend a CP for a second one and get uh, Seer of the Shifting Vector. Because as I explained in other videos, statistically, it will return more command points to you every game than the one command point it costs you to get it. Um, and if you have to spend a CP for an extra relic because you've already got the Sunstorm or maybe Falchus Wing or something, fine, totally worth it. Just It's just not it's not that big a resource expenditure. Even in a game, therefore, if you're going to a big tournament, even in a game in which you just don't really use this because you end up needing your Strands of Fate dice for other stuff or you can't get the far, or there's no good target, I don't know. It's just not that, it, it doesn't require much of you to include it. And it's just this crazy powerful tool. If you have given this combo to an Assault Seer, right, who's tripped out with Executioner and Smite and Crushing Orb. I talked about that build in my other video. Now you have this Farseer that's putting out somewhere between six and a billion mortal wounds uh, in the shooting phase. And that's after, in, in the Psychic phase, putting out maybe D3 mortal wounds for Smite, 2D3 mortal wounds for Executioner, and uh, the equivalent, essentially, of D3 mortal wounds for crushing orb that's so that's so good that's terrifying that that's you're dropping uh an average of like 10 to 12 mortal wounds and that's without hot dice on your opponent uh it can be a little bit tricky to keep a frontline farce you're using this i'm talking about giving your opponent an incentive to eliminate a unit so uh what you can do is put the farseer just 18 inches from the target and after you shoot, I mean, if you're doing smite and stuff, you, you might have to think about it, right? Because you, you have to smite the closest unit and then you want to make sure you still have something to shoot. But uh, you, you're going to use battle focus plus matchless agility to then fly away after you've done this and screen your farseer and screen your farseer. So the most obvious move is to give this to a farseer skyrunner. Uh, who is tripped out as an assault seer. But the other move, and I think in, in really balanced lists, the move that might make more sense is actually to give it to that midfield farseer who has doom and some other psychic power, uh, who, who is also there to, to score Warpcraft secondaries if you need the farseer to do so, who hangs out just in front of your deployment zone, out of line of sight, well-screened, that that model is just ideally positioned to to do this if if and when you need it. Now, one way to go wrong with this build is to just decide on turn one your farseer has to be. You're just so excited to see the look on your opponent's face when she realizes that you can do like twelve mortal wounds with your farseer. Uh, the, you you just rock it for the front line. That That is not the move. You play a little conservative with this, right? So maybe you don't shoot anything turn one, unless your opponent has something very fast and forward, like big Tyranid monsters or something. But if your opponent isn't like getting first turn and closing with you fast, it's okay if your Farseer with Kurnos' bow stays out of line of sight and scores like mental interrogation and uses the CP to still doom something. Uh, it, it's okay. And then as your opponent starts to move into the midfield, now you use this to start just mopping up units because if your Farseer also hangs closer to your own line, it will be easier to, to protect your Farseer, to screen your Farseer, to keep it alive and make it hard for your opponent to, to counter this. And then in the late game when there's not a lot left on the board, oh my goodness, is this model just absolutely terrifying in the late game. It can fly onto an objective with a whole squad of enemy infantry on it and just wreck the squad. It's it's so powerful. Now, there are going to be turns, right, in which you just don't, despite your rerolls, you don't get the strands of fate dice that you need, in which case, now is not the moment to make your move, right? Uh, 
Also, maybe sometimes you need strands of fate for other things. Maybe sometimes you really need those armor save or saves or you really need a, a charge roll or whatever. And you just don't have, the dice aren't there. And what's nice is you're going to know at the beginning of the battle round whether or not you have the resources to make this reliable or not. But most turns and most games, it's going to be there as an option, which is fabulous. Okay, for those of you who are not going to run the far-flung craft world, who maybe are feeling a little bit pouty because you're a dedicated Bell 10 player or or whatever, uh, keep in mind that you can still, this is still good just using Strands of Fate on the wound roll. It's, it's not as reliable, but it's still very, very good. And if you're not playing super high level competitive play, it's just you know the the sort the sort of standard competitive play that you'd get from most people at your local game store that's like pseudo competitive where you're both trying to win you're both trying to pick good secondaries but maybe 50% of the units and the list were picked because you like the narrative or you like the look of them or um I play that way too. I think that's a, there are a lot of ways to play 40k. That's a great way to play. And at that level of play uh this is this is great, right? You, so yeah, it's not going to be the insane mortal wound engine, but at that point it's appropriate to to take it down a notch so you can run a lesser version of this in a slightly less competitive 40k and and it will it will do the work for you right it's in, in some kind of way it's it's sort of scalable in really competitive games uh if, if you really have ambitions to finish four and one at a gt or something then i then i think you probably do only want to do this if you are using the far-flung craft world build otherwise you know, having a one in six instead of a one in three of getting the the fate dice you need, uh, it's 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 significant. It changes the equation in a big way. But there's still flexibility in the build because only one far flung craft world trait is spoken for. So it's not like there's even one specific narrow sub faction build that you have to commit to. I'm a huge fan of Children of Prophecy. I have found it just so good. Uh, a lot of people who are leaning into shuriken lists, which Hail of Doom often lines up with, who are using a lot of shuriken cannons, rely on masterful shots because with the only minus one AP on the shuriken cannon, especially with the new Armor of Contempt rule where Space Marines shrug off the first minus one of AP, you really need masterful shots to make those shuriken cannons do the work. So, uh, you know, if, if that's true, but whatever your other far flung craft world trait is, as long as you have the one, this is going to work for you. And there's, there's lots of units. There's lots of units that benefit from that trait. Okay. So, so that's what I've got short video. This is, it's a really powerful tool. You can have a lot of fun with this in games. It's incredibly useful for competitive play. Uh, I, in your beer and pretzels play group, you might not want to do, do this. Uh, it, it might be a feel bad moment if your opponent's uh, demon prince is just auto killed by your farseer with psychic powers and a pistol. Um, but maybe in those games you've you know you've you've scaled it down by not running um, Hail of Doom. In any event, great tool, love it. I think you're going to have a lot of fun with it. Uh, it it works at a variety of levels and a variety of ways. If you have your own thoughts on uh, how to use this build most effectively, what sorts of matchups it works well in, maybe how it plays into the current meta against Tyranids or Tau, or what experiences you've had with it, maybe leave those thoughts below. Or if you just want to leave a comment to help out the algorithm, I always appreciate that too. If you are interested in receiving this content regularly and you have not subscribed, please consider subscribing. I have a lot of cool content lined up for this month. So if you've been on the edge about whether or not to become a Patreon, now is a great moment to do it. All right, I'll stop trying to sell you on the Patreon. Thanks, guys. Good times. Good luck in your next campaign. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing you all again soon. Take care.